And I tell you, one line of that last song got me. And uh, it said, His, that he will my shield and portion be. And that's where, that's where I lost it in the middle of that, in that song. But you think about it, when the devil attacks, who is our shield? Who is our support? Who is our help? I look into the hills and where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. I'm so grateful this morning for Jesus and what he did for us. I, I just think how blessed we are to have grown up and have lived in a country like this where we have free access to the gospel. We have a church on every corner. We can choose which one we want. We have Bible translations in, in whatever flavor you want. Um, we, we face no persecution for sitting in this room right now. We are the most blessed people who have ever lived. Amen. And we take it for granted. Don't you? Yes. In 1948, there were five missionaries who set out from their compound in Bolivia into the jungles to make contact with a tribe called the Iore people. They left that morning with just a few days worth of supplies, some gifts for the people, and a really basic knowledge of the Iode language. Just a few words, Jesus loves you. They left that morning, nobody had ever made contact with this tribe. They were known to be violent and be hostile, and they were thought to be cannibals. The other missionaries in the area went to their compound and tried to stop them. They, they, they grabbed them and said, why are you doing this? Why, why are you going out there? You know you're never going to make it back. And these five men, George Hosback, Bob Dye, Eldon Hunter, Dave Bacon, and Cecil Dye, they stood up and they said these words, it is because the glorious name of Jesus is not known there, and it must be made known at any cost. Gosh, good way to start out today. Those five missionaries walked into the jungle and they were never heard from again. They lost their lives. They were martyred by the very people that they went to go and reach. You've probably never heard their names and you've probably never heard their story because it's been eclipsed by well, more well-known missionaries like Jim Elliott. But there was something deep inside the heart of these people that said, it doesn't matter the cost. I must go. I must go. Even when others said, don't go. You're doing fine work here. You're, you're building churches. You're building orphanages. Don't go. Why did they go? Because they knew that these people didn't know the name of Jesus. And listen, we sit here 70 years later, 70 years after this happened, and nothing has changed. The mission is the same. That there's people that don't know the name of Jesus. And listen, I'm going to be brutal with us for a little bit. We're sitting in a very comfortable auditorium. It's cold outside. It's pretty warm in here. We're sitting in padded seats, we're watching screens, we're opening Bibles. We've been studying the life of Jesus for 10 weeks with no fear that because we're speaking his name, the police aren't going to come through the door and, and arrest us. There's no fear. We're, we're, we've been very comfortable here as we study this. We sit and we talk about the name of Jesus when there are a billion people who have never heard it. Sometimes I think we forget what our real mission is. And that's to go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you and what did Jesus promise. And lo, I am with you, even into the end of the age. We have this mission and we forget it sometimes, that I'm with you. I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking for you. We, we forget this mission. There was one person, though, that never forgot his mission. Never for one minute of one day did he ever forget what he was there to do, and that was Jesus Christ. Every time he gets up to speak, he, it's the gospel. He shares with, with people the truth. Every, every time he speaks, even to his enemies, it was the saving truth that if we believe in him as our Savior, that we will be saved. Nothing has changed in 70 years. There are still people, and I'm, and I'm not just saying you've got to go to the deepest jungles in South America to reach these people. Across the street from you, there's people that don't know Jesus. There's people, we have so much access to the gospel and so much apathy for the gospel. 
It's time for us to understand this. Look, we're going to read a passage. I want to see I want to see something that Jesus said and who he talked to. And I want to energize us this morning for this mission that God has given us. So go with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 21. If you're joining us for the first time in this series, we've been studying through the life of Jesus from Christmas to Easter in the Gospel of John. So we've kind of hit some big points in each chapter, we're, we're a little bit over, this week will be the first part of the second half of this series, and so we're going to be in John chapter 8, and we're going to read verses 21 to 30. Once you've got it, I'm going to ask you to stand with me to give honor to God's word. If you don't have a Bible with you this morning, there are Bibles in the pew rack in front of you, and then also we will have the words up here on the screen. So follow along. I'm going to be reading out of the CEV version this morning. It's an update of the King James, and it, it is, um, it's going to be what we're going to go through this morning. So this is John chapter 8, verse 21. Jesus also told them, I am going away, and you will look for me, but you cannot go where I am going, and you will die with your sins unforgiven. And the people asked, does he intend to kill himself? Is that what he means by saying we cannot go where he is going? And Jesus answered, you are from below. I am from above. You belong to this world, but I don't. That is why I said that you will die with your sins unforgiven. If you don't have faith in me for who I am, you will die and your sins will not be forgiven. Who are you? They asked Jesus. And Jesus answered, I am exactly who I told you at the beginning. There is a lot more I could say to condemn you, but the one who sent me is truthful. And I tell the people of this world only what I have heard from him. No one understood that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. And Jesus went on to say, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know who I am. You will also know that I don't do anything on my own. I say only what the Father taught me. The one who sent me is with me. And I will always do what pleases him, and he will never leave me. And after Jesus said this, many of the people put their faith in him. All right, let's pray, and let's, let's unpack this a little bit. Father, thank you for not giving up on me. As a 15-year-old as a kid with a chip on my shoulder and a, and a bad attitude and a heart that was so wicked, you never gave up on me. You continued to share the gospel with me until I saw the light and I saw the truth and I understood that I'm a sinner and I needed a savior. I thank you this morning that you offer the gospel to every single person, no matter where they came from, no matter what they've done, no matter who they are, you offer salvation to them freely. It's a free gift. All we have to do is accept it. I pray this morning, if there's somebody in this room that doesn't know you as their savior, that today they would accept your free gift of salvation. Lord, teach us. You are the master teacher, and we sit at your feet this morning in your name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. So last week we talked about, we started this little mini series in that Jesus was the teacher. Last week we talked about how Jesus taught. That every time he opened his mouth and taught, he spoke with authority and power and glory and wisdom. This week I want to talk about what Jesus taught. A lot of us know what Jesus taught, right? Even people who aren't Christians know certain things. What's something that a non-Christian would even know about what he taught? Forgive thy enemies. Yeah, forgive your enemies. To love. How about, have you ever heard somebody say, turn the other cheek? I think people say that, they don't even know what it means, right? Turn the other cheek, right? Or do unto others what, what you would have them do unto you. People know what Jesus taught. But this is, I want to I I break it down for us. Because every time that Jesus opened his mouth to speak, he taught the gospel. That's, that's what he taught. That was his mission. That was every single time. And I want you to see something before we even step into this. I want you to understand who Jesus is talking to in this section. He is talking to the Pharisees and the religious leaders. That's going to change everything about how we perceive and how we look at this section. This is who he's talking to. So Jesus had been grappling with these religious leaders for the better part of chapter 7, into chapter 8, and into chapter 9. It was an extended dialogue where these people had tried to trap him, confront him, incite the crowds against him, and it was just this, this time, and Jesus never misses a beat. i got to say, when, when, when I, only one time in my entire ministry when I've been teaching has somebody started to heckle me. 
right? Only one time in eight years or nine years now of ministry, and it was a little kid, it was a little uh, a teenage, little teenage girl, a sixth grader in one of my ministries, and she said something about, you're a liar, and you, and this and that, and she stood up and started saying things, and, and I was tongue-tied. I had no idea what to say. Well, you just stood up, and, and, and I, but I'm teaching. You know, I was 22, and I didn't know what to do, but these people have been heckling Jesus for chapters now. So Jesus finally lays down the law with these guys. And this is what he says. Look at verse 21. Jesus told them, I am going away and you will look for me, but you cannot go where I am going and you will die with your sins unforgiven. That is a very definitive thing to say. What he's saying to them is, I'm headed to heaven. I'm headed to return to my father, to sit at his right hand, and you cannot follow me. Why? Why couldn't they follow him to heaven? They were good people, weren't they? They, they memorized the Bible, they went to church, they tithed, they served. Why couldn't they go to heaven with Jesus? They weren't saved. They didn't believe in him. They thought he was a liar. They said, they said you, you're a child of the devil, that you cast out demons through the devil. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to tell them, and this is number one if you're, if you're trying to follow along with your notes. Number one is this, Jesus taught about sin. Jesus taught about sin. We've got to start here. I think so many preachers and so many churches start with God's love and they say, God loves you and you're so good and you're his child and God, all he wants to do is save you. And we miss a key component of the gospel that why would we need a savior? Why do we need a savior if we're not sinners? Our sin has separated us from God. There's a divide that we cannot cross. And so Jesus tells these religious people, you guys, if you don't believe in me, if you don't change your hearts, you're going to die with your sins unforgiven. Jesus is brutally honest with these people. And he's not just talking to them. I think we'd have a tendency to say, yeah, Jesus, these guys are going to put you to death. These guys are going to cause you to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to, to hell with their sins unforgiven. Good for you, Jesus. And you know what? He turns around and he points a finger at each one of us and says, no, I'm talking to all of you guys. Every single person that's ever lived on the face of this earth. You're sinners in need of a savior. We don't want to hear this, do we? Do you want to hear that you're a sinner? No, pastor, it's cold outside. I don't want to hear about God's warming love, right? No, I, I, I don't want to hear this. But Jesus says, listen, you've got to start here. You've got to start with your need for a Savior. Look at where you are. Look at your condition. And they look at him and they don't understand this at all. They don't understand this at all. In fact, they, they mock him in verse 22. Look what they say. In verse 22, they say, the people ask, does he intend to kill himself? Is this what he means by saying you cannot go where he is going? This is a sarcastic, cruel um, comment. Because in Jewish theology, the worst thing that a person could do would be to commit suicide. They believed that the worst and lowest circles of hell were, were reserved for those who took their own lives. And so what they're saying about Jesus is, he probably plans on killing himself. Because he's going to hell, and we're not going to follow him there. Right? You see, this, 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 is, this is awful. This is people making fun of Jesus, and Jesus never misses a beat. He turns it right around in their heads, and what does he say to them in verse 23? You are from below. I am from above. You belong here. I belong somewhere else. He's saying, no, you guys, you're, you're totally wrong. I'm not going to hell and you guys are going to heaven. It's, it's the opposite. This, this, is some, this is some harsh stuff to say to these religious people. They're, they're so convinced that their religion is going to save them. And he says, you're bound for hell. Your eternal destination is moving in the opposite direction. And this is what the Bible teaches all of us. The wages of sin is what? Death. While God marches toward holiness and justice and righteousness, we march in the opposite direction toward rebellion and sin and wickedness. And it's only by believing in Jesus and turning our back on our sin and repenting and following Jesus can we ever experience salvation. And Jesus is saying to them, listen, your religion is condemning you to hell. And I want you to hear this, church. There are billions of people on the face of this earth who are blindly following religions that cannot save them and are sending them to hell. I'm, I'm, just try, I'm trying to get us to wrap our minds around this big picture. We're very comfortable sitting in this room and there are people who are going to hell without any chance of being saved because so many of God's people say, my religion is inside these four walls from the hours of 11 to 12 on Sunday morning. And so Jesus tells these people, your religion isn't doing anything to save you. They, they knew so much about God. 
They knew more. They would put me to shame. They would put all of us to shame. They had memorized the first five books of the Bible. They knew more about the law than anybody else. They could stand and debate. They gave their tithes and they gave their offerings. Their whole lives were devoted to God. And he says, you've missed the key component of all this. They knew so much. It reminds me of the story from, there was a man named Gordon A. Allis. And he was a chemist who was on the team that discovered synthetic insulin. Okay, so he knew more about the cure, or, or at least the, the prolonged uh, cure for diabetes than almost any person on earth. He, he knew more about it. He, they, they were in the lab that created it. He knew more about the cure, and Gordon A. Alice died of complications related to diabetes. He knew so much about the cure, but he did not apply it to his own life. And this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees. He says, you know more about the cure for sin and death than anybody else? But you're not applying it to your own heart. Every time Jesus teaches, he teaches about sin. The second thing I want to show you guys, number two, is that every time Jesus opens his mouth, he also teaches about salvation. I got to tell you, if we only had the first part and not the second, it would be a dismal group of people. And this is how it used to be. I've got to be honest. When you you read some of the the old sermons that we read and the the, the preachers who would preach hellfire and damnation and they would pound their pulpit and and that's that's all well and good. But I think we've also got to balance this. Jesus said, you know, you're sinners and you need a savior. And then the second part is this. I'm your savior. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So one thing I want to catch in verse 24, look at that with me, verse 24. He says, that's why I said you will die with your sins unforgiven. And then he says this, if you don't have faith in me for who I am. This is so important for us to see. Don't skip over. Sometimes I think we skip over some of the best stuff looking for good stuff. And so I want you to see here that when he says who I am, the word I am is the Hebrew word for God. So this is the the word Yahweh or Jehovah. This is the word, the the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush. When Moses said, who can I, who should I tell them sent me? And what did God respond? I am who I am sent you. So what Jesus is saying here is if you don't realize and respect and believe that I am God, that's what's going to send you to hell. This is a big statement for us. And we know this, he teaches this consistently through the scripture that through him, That's the only way that we're going to be saved. We can try our hardest. We can can give 455 cans to the food pantry and fill it up. We can save every puppy that you see on the street. You can adopt every child. You can do all the good stuff and still be lost in your sins. And Jesus said, you've got to believe that I am the only one who has the ability to save you. We are bound for hell. Those are scary words. We are bound for hell without Christ. But listen to what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where you were bound for hell, Christ lifted you up. And he says, now you can come with me to be with my Father in heaven. John 14, 6, what does it tell us? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But then you read here in verse 27, and it says, no one understood that Jesus was talking to them about the Father. Why couldn't these people get it? Why were they so bullheaded and stubborn? Why why couldn't they understand? He was so plain with them. Why couldn't they get it? Hmm? Sure, definitely. Yeah, they didn't want to surrender to the fact that he was God. They didn't want him to dictate the terms of their life. And that's what salvation is. Us laying down our lives and Christ lifting us up. We belong to him now. 1 Corinthians 2 says, The sinful natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are folly to him and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. These people, they had one thing that they couldn't get past. The fact that he said he was God. They said, I, I can't. I can't believe in that. I can't do that. But still, I want you to see the missionary heart of Jesus in this. He stops and he gives them another opportunity. After they've made fun of him, after they've plotted to kill him, after they're trying to trip him up, still he says here in verse 28, Jesus went on to say, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know who I am. He's talking about his crucifixion. He's, he's talking about the fact that, that one day they will crucify him and they'll lift him up on a cross. And he says, then you'll understand that I'm paying the sin debt for the whole world. I'm paying for all the mistakes you've ever made. 
And, and in fact, when, you, when we, in the story, when we see Jesus crucified, the centurion stands at the, at the foot of the cross and what does he say? Surely this must be the Son of God. Surely this has got to be him because when Jesus died, the earth shook. The rocks split open. Graves were opened. The, 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 the sky turned black. Lightning and thunder struck. The veil in the temple was torn. And the people, that's when he says, you'll understand who I am. You'll understand that who, the, who I am. I am. I am God in the flesh. He taught them about salvation. He offers them this opportunity. Now listen to this. this these are his enemies. Do you think he doesn't know that these are his enemies? Do you think he doesn't know that they're going to be putting him to death? That they're going to incite the crowd to cry out, crucify him? He knows. And listen to this. This is the, the key verse out of all this. Verse 30. After Jesus said this, many of the people put their faith in him. Stop for a second. Many of the people put their faith in him. Who is he preaching to? The Pharisees, the religious leaders. <coughs> many of the Pharisees and the religious leaders put their faith in him. This morning, if you're sitting here and you've been praying for somebody to get saved for a long time, don't ever stop. Don't ever stop. Don't, don't give up. Don't stop sharing the gospel with them. Don't stop telling them the truth. Don't stop praying for them because even Jesus' enemies, some of them came to faith in Christ because of his message. This is Jesus' heart and his passion. He wanted to reach people and teach people the truth that, they're, that they are sinners before a holy God, but that salvation is possible through him. Church, I'm going to say something this morning. It doesn't matter how long you've been a member here. It doesn't matter how much money you've given to the church. It doesn't matter how many ministries you've served in. It doesn't matter how many good things you've done. I love that you do all those things. But listen, you can do all those things and still be lost as a dog. You can still be lost in your sins. You've got to recognize that Jesus is the only way. The only way. Not one of many ways. Not the best way of several. The only way. When we stop and we recognize I am a sinner and my sin has condemned me to hell, but Jesus paid for and provided the way to salvation, that's what changes everything. Let me tell you a story as I close. My Uncle John was a mean old drunk. That's the best way to start this story. He ran away from home when he was about 17 years old, never looked back. Um, very successful in his life. He owned several bars. Uh, the world would look at him as a success. He drank himself almost to death on several occasions. My dad tried and tried and tried to share the gospel with him. Even uh, at one point, he needed a liver transplant. And my dad stood at his bedside and preached the gospel to him. And my Uncle John looked at him, raised his fist, and said, If you speak the name of Jesus to me one more time, I'm going to punch you in the nose. <laughs> And my dad said, you better punch away because I'm not going to stop. And uh, he got the transplant and he lived for another few years. And my dad tried and tried and tried to share the gospel with him, but he was so hardened to it. He said, well, we're all basically good. We're probably all going to go to heaven anyway. So we got news in Bolivia that my Uncle John, they had called in hospice and that his organs were shutting down and that he probably only had a few days of life left. So my dad got on the computer and he said, I'm going to book a flight. I've got to get back. I've got to share the gospel with him one more time. One more time. I've got to, I've got to stand before him. I can't, I can't stand before my creator without standing before my brother one more time and sharing the gospel with him. So my dad's on the computer buying a ticket and the phone rings. It's my Uncle John. My Uncle John never called my dad in Bolivia. Never, he was a cheapskate. He didn't want to pay the money to, to make a phone call there. And my Uncle John said, Paul, don't buy that ticket. My dad said, how do you know I was buying a ticket? He said, I know you. I know you're going to buy a ticket. My Uncle John said, a man came to my door yesterday, knocked on the door, and asked him, can I watch TV with you? My Uncle John said, that's the weirdest request I've ever had from somebody knocking on my door. But he said, sure, why not? And they went in and they turned on a Billy Graham crusade. Oh. <laughs> and my Uncle John knelt down next to the TV and gave his heart to Christ. That man was mean and bitter and hardened. No, no, no preacher wanted to be within a mile of that guy. He knelt down and gave his heart to Christ. That Sunday, they took him in his wheelchair and they, they dipped him into the baptistry in his wheelchair and everything and brought him back up. And he was baptized in the church. And then that Monday, he died. Let me tell you this. This is the heart of Jesus. 
Every single person matters to him. Every single person, doesn't matter what they've done, doesn't matter where they've been, doesn't matter what path they've taken, it doesn't matter what upbringing they had, doesn't matter what culture they come from, it doesn't matter who they are, Jesus loves them and he wants them to know that they have salvation available in Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's not a secret club that you, that, you, that you get selected to join. You have every ability to repent and turn away from your sin and choose Jesus as your Savior. Don't ever give up on anybody. I've got several family members in my mind right now that I, that I know are not saved. I know you do too. People in the community, people in your family, people in your home. Don't ever give up on them. Look at verse 30. And this is where we're going to end this morning. Verse 30 says, after Jesus said this, Many of the people put their faith in Him. And we pray. Father, I, I love you, Lord. I'm so grateful for the legacy that you've left my family. Lord, on all sides, Billy Graham preached and my grandparents got saved. My other set of grandparents got saved. My uncle got saved. Lord, you are so gracious to me. Jesus, I pray that this morning... We are religious people. I pray if there's one person who, who thinks their religion is going to save them, I pray that you would you'd do something with them. You do a miracle in their heart that I can't do, my words can't do, but your word can. I pray we come to realize that it's not our deeds that save us, it's your blood shed on Calvary for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins, to absorb the wrath that you had prepared for sinners. And now all we have to do is put our faith in you and trust in you as our Savior, and we will be saved. I pray that every single person would at least have that opportunity to hear that, to know that, and to respond to that. Jesus, I thank you for everything you do for us. I lift you up and I give you all the glory. It is through you and your name that we are saved. Amen.